Welcome back, everyone, to our sixth and final reaction episode to Extra History's Simon Bolivar. It's been an exciting journey for me. Uh, I've learned a lot about a guy that I knew very little about going into this series. I hope you've learned something along the way as well. Hopefully, I've added a little bit of context where I'm able to here and there, but this has largely been a learning journey for me. And down the road, we'll do more of this. I think you guys have responded very positively uh, to me doing something out of my comfort zone. And uh, once again, I, I thank you all for the constant recommendations. I do read every single comment on every single video, even if I don't respond or react to it. I do read them all. So rest assured, if you say something, I do see it. Uh, so I appreciate all the great uh, feedback, all the suggestions. I do take those into consideration when considering what I'm going to do in the future. Uh, so keep those coming. Thank you once again to everybody who's been subscribing. We're hitting about 800 new subscribers a day, which just blows my mind. Uh, be watching later today or tomorrow sometime. I will have my video from my visit to Hollywood Cemetery in Richmond, uh, where you'll see some of the most famous people, uh, particularly from the American Civil War, are buried there. Uh, there are two American presidents, as well as the Confederate President Jefferson Davis. Uh, you have generals such as uh, Jeb Stewart and George Pickett. Uh, and others that are buried there. Fitzhugh Lee is buried there. Uh, so there's a lot that you'll be able to see, as well as the Confederate dead from places like Gettysburg, the Richmond battles, and a number of others. Let's go ahead and dive into the final part of Simon Bolivar. All of Simon's hopes were pinned to his great conference. It was going to be like the Amphictyonic League that had once, centuries ago, brought all the Greeks together in a common confederation, a common understanding of who they were. The most common phrase used today to describe the Congress of Panama is a resounding failure. So, you know, I have to point out, uh, we did a recent series on uh, Otto von Bismarck, uh, who united uh, the German Empire. Uh, into a common empire, and uh, you can't help but see some parallels between Bismarck and Bolivar. Uh, of course, where it's going to diverge is obviously the uniting of uh, Bismarck, uniting all the German peoples into a German, well, not all the German peoples, but a lot of the German people into the German Empire, at least the North German peoples. Uh, Bolivar wasn't able to do that, and I'll be curious to see what goes wrong. Bolivar decided not to attend the Congress of Panama. Too many rumors were already circulating about him wanting to make himself a king, and he wanted to show that the Congress was completely free of his influence. But unfortunately, Bolivar's influence was the only thing mm. still holding this fragile idea of a Pan-American League together. The you know, this is an excellent point because it's a, it's a catch-22. He's trying not to be seen as the overbearing guy who wants to take power like Napoleon did. But at the same time, it's his charisma and his leadership that has brought them to this point. Uh, again, to make a parallel, uh, imagine if the United States had had the Constitutional Convention in 1787 and George Washington didn't attend. Uh, Washington was the uniting figure that was able to bring together 13 uh, states that were in a loose confederation and make them into a nation under the Constitution. And so without his presence, I wonder if that would have been possible. And so I can see already why this is a problem. The Peruvians long felt that he had overstayed his welcome in their country, and they wanted nothing to do with joining Gran Colombia. Brazil was a monarchy, and so wanted nothing to do with these fledgling republics. Argentina was terrified of being steamrolled by Gran Colombia, and so wanted nothing to do with the Congress in general. And the Bolivian delegates? They just didn't make it there in time. Worse still, Bolivar's vice president, Santander, the man he had left in charge of Gran Colombia, had now been running Gran Colombia for so long that he chafed at the idea of Bolivar reasserting himself over the country that he'd essentially abandoned. So even Santander was wow. no help in forwarding Bolivar's cause at all. So I'm a little surprised that Brazil would have even been a discussion in all of this because, I mean, I don't know culturally how they line up with some of these other nations, but... Uh, just in terms of the fact that they were largely ruled by Portugal rather than Spain, which most of the rest of South America had been. So they're speaking a different language. They've been under a different mother country. Uh, it just didn't doesn't seem like that would have been a natural fit anyway. But even as the Congress fell apart, more bad news was on the way. While he was still in Peru, a plot on Bolivar's life was uncovered. The plan was to kill Bolivar and expel all Colombians from the country, reasserting Peru as its own state. 
Bolivar responded swiftly, mm. exiling or executing those involved. But while history largely sees these sentences as justified, they did nothing to win him popularity in Peru. Then another misfortune struck. One of Bolivar's most trusted generals, Paez, the man who had led his cavalry, who had inspired the plainsmen, who had been instrumental in winning Bolivar the war, rebelled. Mm. But his rebellion was an odd one. He mess. rebelled for Bolivar. He called for Venezuela to break from Gran Colombia and shake off the rules of Santander, the vice president that Bolivar had left in Bogota. And so now Bolivar had both his general, Paez, and his vice president, Santander, begging for him to return with his army and help him crush the other guy for the sake of the revolution. Wow. So Bolivar returned to Gran Colombia, not to take sides, but to heal the breach. And that he did for a little while. Because even his enemies said that when they were with him, they could not help but love him. It was like a spell. The guy had charisma in spades. Again, we've talked about this. When you have a charismatic leader that everything gets built upon, that's great as long as he's around, either alive or physically present. As soon as he's gone out of the country, gone somewhere else, or once he's gone, gone, you're done for. And you can't build on a personality. It just never works. All of their grievances melted before his energy and open arms. But as soon as he was out of sight, all those enmities would spring up again. And his health was not what it once was. He was now gaunt, skeletal, eaten by consumption, the very disease that had taken his parents. But he was never one to quit, and so he took back up the mantle of power in Gran Colombia. But his dictatorial ways isolated him more and more. And as he traveled the countryside, he saw the true effects of his revolution, of his republic. He saw a wasteland with roads destroyed, crops untended, the populace that he had freed were worse off now than when he'd stood outside of Rome so many years ago. And when he tried to do anything about it, he was met time and again with one unassailable fact. The country's treasury was empty. Santander had even negotiated a huge loan from the British to help keep the government afloat, but that loan was already gone. I wonder how the British must have viewed Simon Bolivar, because we talked uh, before about how he had this British legion, but it sounds like they were largely kind of mercenaries and not really official members of the British government. Um, you know, if you're the British government and you are an empire of your own with colonies all over the world... How much are you really going to help someone who has just broken away from Spain? Because if you show that they can be successful, isn't that going to inspire your own colonies to want to break away? And you just lost the United States in the last couple of decades. Um, don't you want to avoid that happening? Under whispers of corruption and mismanagement. More even than corruption, though, there was one all-consuming source that had swallowed up the money. And that was the army. For years now, Gran Colombia had essentially footed the bill for Bolivar to gallivant through Spanish America, liberating country after country. Revolutions aren't cheap, and Gran Colombia had just paid for at least six. Hmm. Now the people of Gran Colombia strained against that yoke. But Bolivar, beset on all sides by news of military setbacks, felt that he couldn't shrink the military right now. Peru had not only broken from the Federation, but invaded what was to become Ecuador. Bolivia was in turmoil and close to being lost. There were even insurrections in the heart of Gran Colombia. How could he risk reducing the army at this critical time? But it was the revolt of Peru that really tore a rift between Bolivar and his vice president Santander. Santander practically cheered the loss of Peru. Not having to garrison such a large and querulous mm. state would save the government a fortune. But Bolivar saw Santander's reaction as a shot in the back. He saw Santander celebrating something which would ruin his grand project of a universal Spanish-American federation. He even began to suspect that Santander might have oh aided the rebellion. Bolivar was in the field when he got the news about Peru. Tensions flared and things escalated. Santander abrogated the dictatorial powers that Bolivar had been given, and in response, Bolivar, the champion of democracy, turned his army around and began to march on Bogota, the very first capital he had liberated. Hmm. Surprisingly, when he got there, no blood was shed. An uneasy peace was formed, with the vice president still serving his office. But one thing was clear to Bolivar. The Constitution of Gran Colombia, one so different than the one he had pinned for his beloved Bolivia, was the problem. It kept getting in the way. It kept preventing him from doing what needed to be done. <laughs> the Constitution 
that we've put in place to curb power and to protect liberties and things like that is getting in the way of me doing what I want to do. So we're just going to kind of ignore it. Uh, let's be honest. I'll give you an example of somebody who kind of did the same thing, and that's Abraham Lincoln. Uh, Abraham Lincoln gets into the American Civil War. He has a third of the country rebelling against the other two thirds. And he had a very particular interpretation of what the Constitution did and did not say. Uh, I wouldn't say that he just completely ignored the Constitution, but he had a very particular interpretation of it that justified some of the things that he did. Uh, so, you know, in, in Lincoln's case, the Constitution was a little bit inconvenient for him achieving the ends. Uh, now, I know that that doesn't fit with our picture of Abraham Lincoln as this benevolent, perfect, martyred president who was our greatest president ever. And listen, I'm a huge fan of Abraham Lincoln. He's one of my favorite presidents. I think he was a fantastic leader. Uh, that doesn't mean you have to agree with everything he did. And for me, that's always kind of bothered me a little bit but I get it. So he called for a great convention to rewrite the Constitution. Okay. But again, with his imperious march of the army against the capital of a country whose democracy he was supposed to defend, there were whispered charges of monarchism. Everyone said that Bolivar, like Napoleon, would try to give himself a crown. So Bolivar tried to remain hands off. He wouldn't attend the convention. He didn't even seem to lobby that hard for anything other than the convention simply taking place. So what a mess this is because it's Bolivar's influence that holds all this stuff together. But in the process, he's viewed as having ambitions of being a monarch or a dictator. And so then he intentionally is hands off. But by being intentionally hands off, the thing can't work. It's just an impossible situation. He he's damned if he does and damned if he doesn't either way. The voting for the delegates came in. Santander had campaigned vigorously and his men were elected in a landslide. In the end, Bolivar only stayed in power because his delegates walked out, leaving the convention with one man less than the quorum they needed to hold a vote. He was forced to sabotage the very convention he'd set up. And in this moment, mm. you get a sense of great sorrow. You see a man who recognized how far he had strayed from those ideals he lived for. But at the same time, you get a sense of a man who feels trapped, who feels compelled to take each individual action, even though each one is yet one more step away from his own desires. Yeah. And so, with the convention in tatters, Bolivar once again took on complete dictatorial powers, abandoning all pretense of rule by republic. Huh. And the assassination attempts started to roll in. More than once he was saved by his mistress, but his list of friends and comrades had dwindled to a paltry few. Some had died in his wars, some had retired, done with public life, some he had alienated. So now I'm starting to understand a little more why there are people, including former Venezuelan President Hugo Chavez, who believed strongly that Bolivar was murdered and that's why he died as young as he did. Even though he had consumption, which might have been tuberculosis, uh, that's what they called a number of things back then was consumption. Um, but you can see why some people may think that it was a little more than that. And some, in the end, he had to put to the firing squad. Now one more from that list rebelled. The idea of a Latin American monarchy was pitched. And again, though he had not been directly connected with it, Bolivar was accused of looking to make himself king. With a heavy heart, one of his loyalist generals decided that there would be no peace for the nation so long as there was Bolivar. And so, once again, Bolivar picked up the sword. Where once he had spent hours in the saddle, he could now only spend an hour or two at a time before he was racked with coughing. Mm. But though well past the vigor of his youth, eaten from the inside out by consumption, Bolivar still remained active, trying to manage the military and the affairs of states. But as another former friend met his death before his armies on the battlefield, Bolivar knew time was up. His health was failing. He would not live much longer. Of this, he was acutely aware. He was reduced to ruin, declared an enemy in many of the states that he'd mm. helped to free, and even banned from much of Venezuela, his homeland. His great dream was crumbling around him. One by one, all the states of Spanish America were abandoning his great project. Gran Colombia was disintegrating around him, and there was nothing he could do, frail skeleton of a man that he'd become. So, one last time, he tried to put affairs in order, to leave some part of the world that he tried to free ready for a world without him. 
He called together all the notable men of the revolution that were left and asked them to oversee the transition of power, to help keep the country together while he retired quietly back to Europe, which he had not seen since his youth. But even this was not to be. The go government wouldn't let him go until new elections were held, and he was destitute. He sold his silverware in order to try to afford the trip. When the new elections were held, the man that he'd asked all those great nobles to let be his successor didn't win. And so Bolivar slunk out of Bogota to make the arduous trip to Cartagena. But even the very ship he was to leave on ran aground. Jeez. And so he sat, exiled in his own homeland, slowly wasting away like the nations he'd founded. Huh. After one last short trip, he died. Not on the battlefield, not with fanfare or ceremony, but of a lung rotting from the inside out. He had not left behind order. He had not left behind a single unified state. He had not left behind a lasting constitution or an enlightened code of laws. But he had left behind liberty. He was the Libertador. So I'm curious, and I know we have a lot of folks uh, who follow this channel in South America. Uh, in particular, folks who are in those states that were liberated by Simon Bolivar. How is he viewed there today? I would love to hear from you. Is he viewed as kind of the father of the country? Is he viewed as the liberator, uh, you know, the liberator? Um, is he viewed negatively because of some of the stuff that came afterwards? Is it mixed? I'd be curious to know. So please let me know in the comment section below. Uh, let me know where you live and how you view Bolivar and how most people you know view Boulevard. I'd be very curious to hear that. Uh, it's been a fascinating series. I hope you guys have enjoyed it as much as I have. Uh, and I'll be looking to do some different things. Maybe we'll do some one-off things for a little while before we get into another long series. Uh, I'd love to dive back into some more World War I stuff at some point. Uh, but I'd also like to get into some ancient stuff. That's an area I don't know nearly enough about either. I know a little bit about ancient Egypt, a little bit about ancient Rome. Uh, but beyond that, not too much. So it might be cool to dive into some of that too. Let me know your thoughts. Use the comment section below. And we'll see you again soon. Thanks for watching.